Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, to the organizers uh, of the conference. I'm extremely happy to be back. Uh, I've been watching with an attentive eye at the different uh, uh, successive conferences on radical democracy here at the New School. Uh, the program this year is particularly rich and particularly stimulating. Uh, I want to also thank uh, my friend Andreas uh, Calibas uh, for uh, his kind words. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about uh, what I'm going to call a living critique of domination. On March 40th, 2016, French sociologist Monique Pesot-Charlot spoke to the thousands of protesters assembled on the 41st day of Nuit de Pou, the radical democratic experience that unfolded at the fabled Place de la République in Paris. A best-selling author, Pesot-Charlot's pioneering work on the French bourgeoisie made her a prominent public intellectual. Pesot-Charlot explained to the crowd that the current crisis of representative government could be understood as a class struggle. And she reminded them that some people on the winning side of the struggle, such as Warren Buffett, had explicitly acknowledged this fact. Pesot Charlot then asked, in a rhetorical flourish, what is to be done? To which she forcefully answered, imitate them. The idea that the many should imitate the few who rule is a long-standing and cherished trope of radical action and thought. If the few have political parties, so should the many. If they have recourse to the urns, so should we. If they seek state power, let us also seek state power, if only to smash it. Such received ideas have monopolized the political action of the many for over 100 years now and they still irrigate the fields of radical action and thought. Against this position, I want to explore with you tonight the need for radical democratic thinkers and activists to tap into the vast resources of, so of the social historical imaginary in order to avoid imitating the few and encourage instead the dissemination of a living critique of domination. If the usual avenues of political action are dead ends, as I think they are, then the task ahead is a daunting one. Following the work of Miguel Abansou, we can conceive of our task as a two-fold endeavor. Firstly, as scholars and activists, we are compelled to pursue a ruthless and radical analysis of all forms of domination, as well as their intersections. And secondly, at the same time, we must undertake a charitable exploration of the cracks and gaps in the current order that have allowed the many to experience freedom, equality, and solidarity. Taken together, the two tasks constitute the program of what I will call a living critique of domination. My point is that the articulation of such a critique also requires a contemporaneous exploration of the living exemplars of emancipatory politics. While it would be impossible to exhaustively detail this twofold task, I want to take the time afforded to me tonight to begin an examination of both insights. The goal of this exploratory discussion is to present some of the answers that radical democratic thinkers and activists can give to the central question of this conference, what is to be done? Before I begin, let me clarify the definition of radical democracy that informs my work. As Marx pointed out, the etymology of radical is root. Hence, radical dem democrats seek a return to the root of democracy. In ancient Athens, the term democracy was used interchangeably with that of isonomy, namely equality before the law and equal participation in the creation of the law. Democracy is rooted in isonomy, more specifically in the second aspect of its definition, the equal participation of the many in the creation of the law. Thus, radical democracy renews with isonomy. So to qualify political instances as radical democratic, it is essential to establish whether or not there were attempts to self-legislate undertaken by the many. The reactivation of ancient isonomy appears as the basic marker of radical democratic experiences. So let's now turn to the first of the tasks of the living critique of domination that I want to articulate with you tonight. Classic scholar Jill Franks recently argued that the experience of the ancient Greek world 
could help us to understand the political rise of a figure such as Donald J. Trump. For her, Plato's Republic warns that oligarchy breeds tyranny, inasmuch as oligarchy rests upon an insurmountable divide between the few and the many. Extreme social stratification forces the many to seek redress through the power of the one. The tyrant is perceived as being capable of rectifying the situation for the many by reducing the power of the few, or to put it in more colloquial terms, by draining the swamp. As it is now clear in the specific case of the United States, the tyrant can also accommodate himself with the few. But Frank's overall point is very suggestive for radical Democrats. Tyranny is not born of democracy, or of an excess of democracy, as some observers have tried to argue. Rather, it is born of oligarchy. As David Tiergarten convincingly demonstrates in his recent study of ancient tyranny, entitled Death the Tyrants, Tiergarten offers a solid historical grounding to Frank's theoretical argument by showing that the sequence of regime change in ancient Greece from the 7th century to the 4th century is out of monarchy and oligarchy to tyranny, and from tyranny to democracy. This brief detour via the ancient world is a timely reminder of the need to renew with a fundamental aspect of political thought, the analysis of regimes. One of the steps towards a radical analysis of all forms of domination is to undertake a renewed analysis of the regime that we live in and that we too quickly and sometimes lazily refer to as liberal democracies. In this respect, I'm taking my cue from some of the most important radical democratic thinkers of our times. Castoriadis holds that we live in liberal oligarchies. For Sheldon Wall, that our regimes are managed democracies. Rancière affirms that our political order uh, uh, as an oligarchy limited by the double recognition of popular sovereignty and individual liberties. Whereas Abansoul argues that we must renew with the analysis of authoritarianism in order to understand the current state of affairs in so-called liberal democracies of the Western world. A radical analysis of domination should offer a detailed examination of the central components of our political regimes with a view to understanding their contribution to democracy in contemporary society. The three main components of the modern state, that is the representative government, the political party system, and large bureaucracies are exclusive of the many in their theoretical genesis as well as in their historical functioning. As Bernard Manet argues in Principles of Representative Government, the theorists and practitioners of this regime were fundamentally anti-democratic and chose, in full knowledge of the facts, to implement a system that would keep public office in the hands of the same types of people. The recourse to elections, rather than sortition, ensures that representative government offers a democratic form of legitimization of representatives that are selected through an oligarchical process. Whereas sortition allows for the selection of anyone and everyone, elections favor the few, those who are distinguished by wealth and notoriety, or a combination of both. The first analysis of the political party system revealed their very uh, real de democratic limits. In his 1902 study, Moise Ostrogorsky argued that the political party system hinders spontaneous political action, limits the scope of action, and reserves political power to the few who run the party machines. This results in a channeling or a neutralization of the democratic political energies liberated by the progressive extension of the right to vote. The functioning of mainstream parties in the Western world confirms this diagnosis. The ongoing attempts to theorize, to create, and to operationalize a new kind of political party, more responsive to its members and to the needs of society, parties such as the PT in Brazil or Syriza in Greece, remain wedded to the framework of the modern state and to its oligarchical functions. Indeed, they consider that the many should necessarily imitate the few, inasmuch as a competition for state power is their ultimate goal. A commitment to radical democracy implies the creation of collective organizations that do not reproduce the organizational forms that serve 
the rule, the rule of the few. As for the great bureaucracies of the modern state, they are organized on the basis of technical expertise and following strict hierarchical lines of command. They mostly employ experts whose legitimacy is bound to these specific and exclusive types of knowledge. Bureaucracies are designed to expand the scope of their influence, as well as extend their realm of application, thereby increasing their power and their presence in society over time. Because of the permanent nature of their structures, and the fact that they are more or less immune to elections or changes in government, bureaucracies constitute a stable and stabilizing component of our political regime that is structurally resistant to transformative radical politics. By virtue of their commitment to technical expertise, they are exclusive of the many. In short, the case can be made that the central components of liberal democracies function like oligarchies that restrict the competition for state power to different categories of oligarchs. Yet this analysis, of course, has to be completed through a radical democratic examination of executive power from the presidency to police and prisons, and also a radical democratic examination of judiciary power. Such an examination should or could specifically focus on gendered, racial, and colonial forms of domination that reinforce the exclusion of the many, uh, thus reinforce also the oligarchic structure of these powers. In addition to a critical study of our political regime, the task of a radical analysis of domination today ought to discuss the major trends that characterize the globalized neoliberal order of capitalism. To name only one example, and here I could have given you a laundry list of different examples that need to be uh, analyzed and criticized following a radical democratic lens, but I'll focus on one and I'll leave it up to each and every one of you to pick one and, and run with it. To name only one example, we can focus on what Elizabeth Anderson calls private government in her eponymous 2017 book. In it, Anderson describes the role played by employers in the constitution of a private form of government that is devoid of any accountability to those they govern. The firm's rule over its employees is, in the American context, especially arbitrary and unequal in terms of strength and power. What is commonly known as labor relations is actually a skewed struggle in which the many are forced to acquiesce to the dictates and the whims of the few. The daily denial of the autonomy of employees, who remain without any real recourse against most employers, allows for an experience of domination that in the particular case of Walmart, the largest private sector employer in the US, has been compared to living inside the Leviathan. While a critical appreciation of contemporary society is necessary, it remains insufficient. To articulate a living critique of domination, we must also examine, as I said earlier, the cracks and the gaps in the current political order. These cracks and gaps created by emancipatory political experiences, however fleeting they may be. I conceptualize such emancipatory moments as plebeian experiences in my 2013 book on the discontinuous history of political freedom. With this term, I wanted to emphasize the exemplary nature of the political secession of the Roman plebs on Aventine Hill in 494 before Common Era. This little-known and under-theorized configuration of political strategies unfolded following three distinct moments. One, the interruption of the political status quo by way of a secession from Rome. Two, the creation of a new political order on Aventine Hill, and three, the return to a Rome that is politically transformed by the plebeian withdrawal. At each moment, we can observe the political subjectivization of the many, <coughs> hitherto considered to be a sub-political entity, and whose entry into political agency leads to a deepening of freedom in the public realm. 
as I showed in my work, the threefold strategy put forth by the Roman plebs is recurring through the political history of the Western world, from ancient Rome to the Paris Commune of 1871 uh, and beyond. Although this framework does not exhaust the richness and the multiplicity of a politics of the many today, the discontinuous history of the plebeian experience can help us to identify key characteristics that are the proper of radical democratic politics and that we should attempt to understand, to advocate, and even to disseminate. So in order to explore the cracks and gaps of the current order, I now want to turn to three exemplars of radical democratic politics. And I want to illustrate them using some recent emancipatory political experiences. These exemplars are embracing indeterminacy, living with division and conflict, and championing emancipatory political subjects. So let's begin with the first, uh, embracing indeterminacy. If we turn for a moment to the history of political thought, more specifically to its relationship to democracy, we can see that the adversaries of democracy, and here I'm thinking of people like Plato, of course, but Madison, also closer to us, Schumpeter, are in agreement with the advocates of democracy, so people like Lefort, Castorius, and Rancière, on two crucial points. So we have the adversaries of democracy and uh, the uh, partisans or the advocates of democracy who agree on two different points. One, that democracy is a form of disorder. Two, that the bearer of this disorder is the many. While the adversaries of democracy wish to rid the political realm of disorder by neutralizing a politics of the many, the advocates of democracy consider the disorder to be the vital source of freedom and autonomy. For radical democratic theorists, the presence of disorder testifies to the impossibility of a metaphysical foundation of the law. Hence, disorder is, is caused by the fact of indeterminacy, to use Claude Lefort's terminology, or chaos, to quote Castoriadis, or even contingency, as Rancière argues. All of these descriptors seek to clarify the idea that political foundations are born of temporary agreements within a political community, and that they cannot be naturalized and regarded as the definitive solution of political life. They are historical and are subject to the judgment of history. Hence, embracing indeterminacy entails accepting that the tension between disorder and order, between the instituting and the instituted, to take uh, the terminology of Castoriadis, cannot be surpassed or resolved. Acknowledging this allows radical democratic theorists to justify the political action of the many and refuse to fetishize the established order or the instituted order. The politics of the many carries with it a negation of the status quo, and this is what allows for an extension of freedom in the political realm. The never-ending creation of political forms through the action of the many is precisely the type of effervescent political life that radical democratic theorists identify during emancipatory political experiences. Because of the demands it puts on political subjects, the temporality of the instituting process is exhausting, to quote Miguel Abansoua. It remains, nevertheless, the preeminent bulwark against the centripetal movement that governs political institutions. And it is precisely this centripetal movement which transforms institutions into self-sufficient totalities thus restricting the scope of political action by reducing it to the functioning of a particular organizational form. An embracing of indeterminacy can be seen during the events of Nuit Debout, so Rise Up at Night, that began on March 31st, 2016, and lasted until the end of June 2016. This broad and inclusive occupation of a public square in Paris originated as a protest 
against a bill designated to reform the labor code in France. It's referred to this law as the El Comi Law. It was named after the minister who put forth and who sponsored uh, the bill. Louis de Boulle rapidly became the locus of a wide-ranging critique of the status quo in France that swiftly morphed into an experience of autonomous self-institution. Leaderless, the occupation was organized along radical democratic principles with a general assembly and a myriad of smaller committees established to examine specific problems as well as organizational issues and then report back to the assembly. The participants and the facilitators of the assembly fully and openly assumed the experimental quality of the occupation. As one moderator explained to the assembly, and I quote, we are all learning together on this side of the assembly and on the other, this democracy that we want to invent, end quote. For some observers, the indeterminacy of Nuit Debout testified to its weakness as a political movement. Because it did not have strong leadership or clear political objectives, it was unable to create a, quote, mass hegemonic process, end quote, that would have allowed the event to last and thus avoid defeat, as Patrice Manigier argued in a recent issue of L'État moderne. Against this position, Etienne Tessin invites us to think about political action in general, and Nuit Debout in particular, beyond the categories of victory and defeat. For Tessin, the events of Nuit Debout were first and foremost transformative for those who participated. In this sense, there is for him a remainder born of the experience and following Arendt, Tassin will call this transformative experience and its remainder the lost treasure of revolutions. As such, the experience is not a means to an end. Rather, it is an end in itself. After all, in the heart of an over-gentrified Paris, Paris, Rue de Boue allowed for an experience of isonomy, as well as the creation of a new social bond between strangers. The richness and the significance of Nuit Debout requires fresh analytical perspectives, rather than a facile redux of mainstream political categories. Nuit Debout was also criticized for being riddled by conflict and weakened by division. The presence of conflict and division has often been considered a major obstacle for emancipatory politics. It is repeatedly said that struggles are too fragmentary, that political subjects are not unified enough, and that the objective pursued, pursued are inconsistent. Against this trope of radical thought, I'd like to invoke a counter-tradition of Western political thought that regards conflict and division as inescapable, or even beneficial, for a political community, inasmuch as conflict and division are the result of the condition of plurality and can be politically productive. As a heterodox reading of Machiavelli suggests, the Florentine secretary is not a teacher of political evil or the author of bedtime reading for tyrants. Rather, Machiavelli is a political educator. The term is from Miguel Abonso. The substance of his teachings deal with the political consequences of the conflict generated by the division between, and I'm quoting Machiavelli here, the division between the two different dispositions that are found in every city. The people who are everywhere anxious not to be dominated and oppressed by the nobles, and the nobles who are out to dominate and oppress the people." End quote. When a political community allows for the manifestation of the conflict between the few and the many, its ultimate effect is the creation, again I'm quoting Machiavelli, the creation of laws and institutions whereby the liberties of the public benefited. In a similar vein, Montesquieu will argue that dissensions and popular tumults are necessary for the development of freedom. He will even claim that, and I quote, as a general rule, whenever we see everyone tranquil in a state, we can be sure 
that liberty does not exist there, end quote. It's a more Machiavellian Montesquieu order used to read. <laughs> Take a look at his considerations. <clears throat> Closer to us, Miguel Abansoul considers that one of the great political problems was correctly identified by La Boétie in his Discourse on Voluntary Servitude as the enchantment and the charm of the name of one. Indeed, the establishment of unity based on the identification with a leader seen as a savior or protector Think of Mao, think of Lenin, think of Trotsky, perhaps we can even think of Trump. Well, this identification with a leader seen as a savior protector opens to the destruction of plurality and the creation of new forms of domination. For Abansoul, we must refuse the name of one and jettison the desire for an eschatological resolution to political problems that would seek to create a political community devoid of division and conflict. In fact, such a community could only constitute itself beyond politics. Black Lives Matter is an example of a political movement living with conflict and division. As we all know, Black Lives Matter began as a Twitter hashtag used by African American community organizers who were outraged by the acquittal of George Zimmerman who shot and killed Trayvon Martin in Florida in February 2012. By 2013, the persistence of extrajudiciary killings of African American citizens across the United States, notably that of uh, Michael Brown and Ferguson, led to the transformation of the hashtag into a diverse social movement. Since its inception, Black Lives Matter has recognized the intersectionality of the African American experience of domination from slavery to today's new Jim Crow. The movement itself is horizontally organized as an association of local chapters across the United States and elsewhere. The different chapters are only required to adhere to a set of common principles. Each individual division preserves the right to decide the type of action they deem necessary in order to advance the cause. There is no hierarchy or centralized leadership, and the membership remi remains the driving force of each chapter. In fact, Alicia Garza, one of the three community organizers who authored the movement, insists on the non-centrality of her own participation in Black Lives Matter. Garza also contends that Black Lives Matter is not leaderless, rather, it is leaderful, because each individual member partakes in the leadership of the movement. In terms of the, the diversity of action, some chapters emphasize the consolidation of bonds between African-American parents and their children, while others will stress the need to cultivate historical memory in order to help create community. An important conflict emerged, however, regarding the ultimate ends of the movement, as well as its relationship to the established political forces in America. For some activists, Black Lives Matter needed... It had to remain the locus of protests and demonstrations against the status quo. With regard to the established political forces, the movement had been criticized for disrupting and undermining Democratic Party candidates and thus helping Republicans. So against the idea that Black Lives Matter is beset by debilitating internal rifts, preventing the movement from doing much at all to accomplish its aims, as a recent article in BuzzFeed puts it, I want to argue that the conflicts and the division speaks to its strength and to its vibrancy as a movement. The pursuit of different objectives, such as developing policy, engaging in local politics, and protesting the status quo, is not contra contradictory or even problematic. In fact, the articulation of a living critique of domination requires all three objectives. Radical democratic theorists and activists need to deal with issues of policy, since policy making, or something that resembles what, what's known today as policy making, would be the object of self-legislation undertaken by the many. As for the question of local political engagement, radical democracy's first terrain is local, even the neighborhood. To the bromide that modern political communities are too large to accommodate radical democratic institutions, we can echo the words of Parisian writer Romain Gary. I am a citizen of Rue du Bac, he proclaimed. That is to say, the street he lived on in the seventh arrondissement of Paris. Gary's identity for those who aren't familiar with his work, 
was blurred by the tumultuous history of Eastern Europe in the early 20th century. Yet he was a Jewish, Russian, Polish, Lithuanian, Frenchman. Yet he was nevertheless able to anchor his political action within a shared community. The local remains a crucial dimension of radical democratic politics. At the same time, Black Lives Matter can also be at the forefront of the protest against the status quo, for instance, when protesting police brutality. In short, as Black Lives Matter illustrates, division and conflict are inherent to, radical democratic, uh, to, the, to a radical democratic political field, whereas the desire to unify is lethal for plurality and for difference. The Black Lives Matter movement is also exemplary insofar as it focused on an emancipatory political subject who was historically excluded from political life and who remains, to a large extent, excluded from political participation. As Michelle Alexander points out in the very first pages of her uh, book, The New Jim Crow, it is all too easy to encounter today African-American men who for five generations have been denied basic political rights. Their ancestors suffered under slavery, the brutal racism of the KKK, Jim Crow laws, and they are now today subjected to a policy of mass incarceration explicitly devised to control African-Americans. The new Jim Crow, more commonly known as the war on drugs. For radical democratic theorists and activists, the emergence of emancipatory political subjects is a central preoccupation. For it reveals the presence of forms of domination that need to be questioned. And it points to a breach in power relationships, thus to a potential for deepening freedom, equality, and solidarity. Of course, we have to rigorously distinguish between emancipatory political subjects and non-emancipatory ones. The alt-right, to take uh, but one example, or one glaring example of the latter, cannot be considered an emancipatory political subject since it seeks to destroy plurality in order to restore a racist and misogynist political order in America, one which would only or could only deepen inequalities and expand forms of domination uh, of the few over the many. By contrast, emancipatory political subjects reveal the arbitrary character of domination and foster the conflict necessary for an extension of freedom. In other words, they embody plurality while furthering equality. In the current context, we can witness the appearance of emancipatory subjects powered by new technologies and social media and who operate outside of the traditional confines of political life. The Me Too movement is a good illustration. While the history of the movement largely predates its transformation into a viral hashtag, Me Too has managed to focus public attention on predatory sexual practices in the workplace, in the classroom, and elsewhere. The Me Too movement has also revealed the limits of a patriarchal judiciary system that is unable to properly adjudicate and administer justice in cases of sexual violence. The possibility of bringing together and empowering strangers victimized by predatory sexual behavior has initiated a process whereby power structures are forced to change because what was once thinkable or possible for people in positions of power is no longer so. By reaching out to the many via social media, Me Too has multiplied the site of struggle for freedom equality and solidarity in contemporary society, transforming the sexual privileges of entitled men into yet another example of the violence inherent to the sexual social contract identified by Carol Pateman in her groundbreaking book. As Latin American scholar Liz Mason Deese points out in the recently published Verso report on the Me Too movement, where freedom starts, uh, which is free to download on the Verso uh, website, the, quote, spread of the hashtag and the narratives accompanying it were powerful as an action through which women could find a collective voice 
intervene in public debate, and also create a new conversation and therefore new subjectivities among women." End quote. For Mason Deese, if we reduce the movement to individual denunciations made by famous women, we are considering it only from its weakest dimension. At its most powerful, Me Too has opened a space to discuss how sexual violence partakes in a larger constellation of violence and domination embedded within the very fabric of contemporary society. Mason Deese further argues that the example of Latin American feminist movements could in indicate a possible pathway for Me Too that would take it from the denunciation of sexual violence to the deepening of equality through the creation of a community which respects plurality and difference. In Argentina, notably, Mason Deese argues that the Ni Una Menos, so that's the Not One Woman Less movement, has a, quote, practice of assemblies where women share stories and where the differences between experiences are not erased, nor ignored, nor insurmounted. Through the assembly, through the process of working out common language, and through taking the street together, a new collective subject is born, end quote. But such assemblies are not restricted to women only. Ni Una Menos has also organized common assemblies with the indigenous Mapuche activists under the name of, or sorry, under the theme of our bodies, our territories, so as to connect the commodification of land and natural resources with the exploitation of women. The recent creation of a follow-up movement to Me Too in Quebec, et maintenant, uh, and now, which seeks to open an exclusive, or sorry, an inclusive dialogue between women and men regarding the actions to be taken in order to put an end to sexual violence, testifies to the possibility of transforming social relations using a radical democratic approach. To conclude, I want to briefly retrace the path we've just taken and highlight the main articulations of my call for a living critique of domination. The project entails the realization of a double task, a ruthless critique of domination, and at the same time, a charitable analysis of emancipatory political experiences. The radical evaluation of domination today includes an assessment of the central components of liberal democracy, as well as of the consequences of the global triumph of neoliberal capitalism. Such an evaluation seeks to expose the underlying logic that confers political and economic privileges to the few to the detriment of the many. The second dimension of a living critique deals with the different cracks and gaps that appear in the current political order. A charitable analysis of emancipatory political experiences can reveal them as exemplars of the radical democratic perspective on politics. As such, the characteristics exemplified by the cracks and gaps suggest the type of political action and political ideas that need to be disseminated by radical democratic theorists and activists. Nuit Debout's experience of indeterminacy, the divisions and conflicts of Black Lives Matter, and the emergence of new political subjects with the Me Too movement. Instead of seeing such characteristics as being challenges to be overcome, I've argued that they speak to the type of politics inherent to radical democracy. Before ending, I would also like to explain my asymmetrical treatment of domination and emancipation. If it is clear why I think that a ruthless critique of domination is necessary, it may be less clear why I think that we should be charitable with emancipatory political experiences. After all, would it not be fairer to be just as ruthless with emancipation as we are with domination? One of the major biases in the evaluation of emancipatory political experiences is that our criteria are inevitably colonized by ideas and categories stemming from the tradition of Western political thought. Take, for example, the categories of stability and instability. The tradition of Western political thought, just like the instituted order, 
values stability and rejects political instability as the bane of political regimes, or the bane of liberal democracy, and a danger for society. The same axiological preference values victory over defeat, unity over division, etc. In order to fairly assess emancipatory political experiences, the first step is freeing ourselves from these inherited biases, which automatically place the messiness and the experimental character of emancipatory politics on the side of failed politics. From a radical democratic perspective, instability, disorder, conflict are precisely the signs of a vibrant and thriving political community. In other words, we need to overcome the conceptual apparatus that reinforces the instituted order that we are ruthlessly criticizing and that we want to transform. A charitable disposition is therefore necessary to avoid being blinded by domination and its effects on perception, desire, and understanding. And so this is also an answer that I think I want to give tonight to the question of the conference, what is to be done? Thank you.